This is episode number 62 of The Inspiring Talk with psychologist Dr. Sabina Brennan. Welcome guys to The Inspiring Talk. My name is Vijay Gautam. I'm host for this show. Each week I interview today's most successful and inspiring personalities to help you realize your inner potential. Thank you so much guys for joining me on this episode of the Inspiring Talk podcast. I am very pumped for my guest Sabina Brennan. Sabina is a research psychologist, neuroscientist and author of the number one best-selling book 100 Days to a Younger Brain. Maximize your memory, boost your brain health and defy dementia. Based in Dublin, Ireland. At the age of 42, Sabina got fascinated with the brain and human psychology and she left her career as an actor to pursue research about brain since then she has been one of the top experts on cognitive psychology in Ireland she has been featured by national radio and television on several occasions she is a recipient of image women of the year 2018 provost award for innovation for social impact 2017 and so on sabina has created over 30 short films that offer practical advice on brain health memory loss and dementia These films have been viewed in more than 140 countries and have been translated into multiple languages including Hindi and Punjabi. I invited Sabina on the inspiring talk to chat about how to keep brain healthy, how to defy memory loss, optimizing memory performance and lot more. So before we jump in, take a pause and make sure to take a screenshot of this episode right now and share it as your story on Instagram. And don't forget to tag me at the rate BJ Speaks. I highly appreciate that. Now, without further ado, let me welcome the one and only Dr. Sabina Brennan. Welcome back, guys. We have Dr. Sabina with us today. Sabina, welcome to the Inspiring Talk. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for being here. It's an absolute pleasure to have you here. few days back i was looking for some information on youtube and came across one of your videos you were talking about how important brain health is and unfortunately we disregard it uh, so we talk about our heart health and even if i can take your words we talk about our dental health but we uh, you know really not bother about the brain health so i think that's a really important topic we really don't see a lot of people talking about taking care of our brain right so i found the work that you do you know pretty fascinating so your book 100 days to a younger brain is already a best seller so congratulations on that thank you thank you very much and i'm delighted you found my videos online it's always great to know isn't the internet wonderful how you can you know yeah. reach so many people um on the totally different part of the world that's yeah, pretty interesting fabulous. yeah i mean how crazy is that 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 we pay so little attention to our most important organ so actually when i I I give a lot of talks about brain health because I'm very passionate about getting that message out there to people and I usually start my talks by asking people to put their hands up if they brushed their teeth this morning <laughs> <laughs> and then I say keep your hands up if you intend brushing them again this evening and all the hands pretty much go up and stay up and then I say so keep your hands up if you did something consciously for your brain health today and pretty much most of the hands go down and it's It is kind of crazy but it's a really really simple way to get that message across to people. Um oh my goodness <laughs> like we don't actually pay any attention to our brain health. True. So we will get into that on this episode, all right? So but before that could you explain to my listeners what does a cognitive neuroscientist does? Well, that's a that's a good question. It's a very very sort of broad term. I mean my degree would be in psychology. Um, and my fascination is with the relationship between the brain and human behavior and i did my phd in the institute of neuroscience in trinity college in dublin and so i actually specifically was looking at electrophysiology physiology so the electrical activity in your brain and how that relates to uh, cognitive functions like memory as we age um so yes i mean the thing is neuroscience a neuroscientist you know that it it's sort of an umbrella term that covers people from many disciplines who explore the brain from multiple angles um, and then a cognitive neuroscientist 
is somebody who is interested in our cognitive functioning. So how we think, um, how our memory works, how we make decisions, how we decide to take risks, you know, all of those things, how we learn, all of those things in a, in a sense that really make us human. Interesting. So it involves all the brain studies and uh, maybe the scans and studying also the behavior pat- pattern of the people. Does that also? Yeah, in- yes. Also and, in- and different people look at, at from from different angles, really, you know. Um, mm-hmm. So, yes, there's people who do MRI scans. There's people, as I did for my PhD, who do electrophysiology. But also you can do it from other types of assessments, you know, testing people's memory or questionnaires. Do you know, they can mm-hmm. give you a sense of how the cognitive function is working um, it, you know compared to because a lot of these tests are, are standardized so you can kind of do these tests and and see whether somebody is performing within an average range for someone their age or their gender that's very interesting uh, so let's get back to you know what we started this conversation with you know talking about we overlook our brain right so why do you think that we have overlooked the uh, you know overlooked taking care of our brain health I think there's probably a number of uh, reasons behind it. Um, I think the fact that we can't see it, you know, that it's inside and because because it is in essence us, if it's so tied up with who we are that I'm not so sure people are keen to see that as, you know, something concrete like, like an organ. <laughs> I'm quite happy with that. I find that much more fascinating, to be honest. I also really think that it's it, it's probably historic in a sense, and 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 I mean that in the the longest form of historic. In that um, people always tried to understand human behavior, but we didn't have the tools to look at the brain. If you go back and look at how philosophers, you know, looked at human behavior, and actually how we've come to say that love comes from our heart, <laughs> and even the shape mm-hmm. that we use to signify love. It, it was really based on sort of guesswork in, in a sense and people trying to make sense of human behavior without actually having the technology um, to, to look at the brain, I guess, because it was almost, you know, behind a skull and it's, it's very, very complex. And so really it is only in the last kind of 30 years or so that there's been the technology that allows us to explore the brain and how it functions and that that has kind of opened up uh, the whole world to being able to I suppose to look at a a a living functioning brain because one thing say with my book actually I was very very adamant that it even though it was about the brain and brain health that I didn't want it to have a brain on the front of it because to me that brain that we're used to seeing that crinkly beige colored thing (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> um, that doesn't represent a brain to me because it just looks like it's a blob, a blob of fat almost. It, you know, it looks dead because usually when we're looking at it, what we're looking at is dead tissue that's been preserved in formaldehyde. And it belies the reality that your brain um, is comprised of 86 billion neurons and trillions of connections that, you know, spend their whole time, like while you and I are sitting here talking, they're firing and talking and communicating with each other and with the Mm -hmm. rest of your body through electrical and chemical signaling, um, which is really, really um, hugely fascinating and and makes for the brain being, you know, a much more vibrant, dynamic uh, organ. Um, And I think that's much more exciting. And actually, I don't know if you've seen the, the, the cover of my book really is an artist's representation of those um, brain cells and connections, um, because uh, I think that's a much more interesting uh, way to look at it. Yeah, I think it's very interesting that you put those billions of uh, cells, you know, firing the neurochemicals and then just being constant, you know, communication with each other. But again, like, you know, as you mentioned, we can't see our brain. So maybe that would be that might be one of the reasons for people not to, you know, actually care about the brain unless it manifests into uh, you know, some uh, disorder. And also yes. there might be the cases where, you know, somebody might be going through the brain disorder, but it might not actually manifest any symptom. I would like to understand from you, since, you know, you, you are talking on your book, uh, 100 Days to a Younger Brain. Can we make our brain younger? Yeah, we can. We can. We can. I mean, I, you know, I'm very careful. You don't want to be making any sort of promises <laughs> um, that are empty. And um, so mm-hmm. I like the term rejuvenate. 
Um, and I do believe it's possible to rejuvenate our, our brain. And, and, and everything in my book is grounded in science, not my not just my research, but basically the book, you know, really collates research that has been carried out by, you know, amazing scientists across the globe um, on lots of populations. So it, it really brings all that together. So essentially, you know, from about the age of 30, your brain is shrinking and it loses about. 0.02 you know percent of volume each each year about two percent volume every 10 years um really yeah and obviously as uh, you know uh, and then the rate of that shrinking or atrophy um accelerates when you hit the age of about 60 so you know if you're losing brain cells and connections between them that will ultimately impact on how well your brain will function now we used to think, first of all, we used to think that the brain was fixed and set like concrete and that once you were an adult, you know, that's the way it was and there wasn't anything that you can do about it. So one of the, the exciting discoveries is that the brain is what scientists um, call plastic, neuroplastic, not plastic like a credit card, but, mm -hmm. but pliable, <laughs> malleable like putty. Do, do you know putty? You know, something that you can bend and, and, and stretch, something flexible. Flexible in it, yeah. Yes, flexible and adaptable. Um, and your brain actually has the capacity to change. And it's your behaviors and your experiences that can change it at any age. It also has the capacity to grow new neurons, just as it, is, as it has the capacity to lose neurons and to prune neurons away if you're not using them. And your brain only weighs 2% of your body, but it actually consumes about 25% of the oxygen and nutrients that you take in. True. So it's a very, very high energy organ. Um, and so it can't afford to to be wasting energy on on brain cells that you're not using. So use it or lose it does apply with your brain. But in in recent times, you know, the current thinking really is that there are things that you can do to maintain your brain volume. So to counteract that atrophy, that natural wastage that seems to occur with age. Now I would argue, and this is just me arguing. This is my sort of hypothesis um, is that that wasting with age is not necessarily a wasting because there's a passage of years or a shrinkage of the brain because there's a passage of years, but rather a shrinkage of the brain because of what we do with our lifestyles from the age of 30. So mm -hmm. for example, the key things to neuro, you know, neuroplasticity is actually the, the brain's ability to change with learning. Mm -hmm. And so learning and challenging yourself and, you know, education and novelty, experiencing new things, they're fundamental to brain health and fundamental to neuroplasticity, to, to increasing the density of the connections in, in your brain and, 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 and so the, the, the volume of your brain. And the thing is, if you think about it, we front load those kind of activities to childhood, to teenage years, and to early adulthood. Because there, when we go to school, university, college, there, when we're having most of our new and novel experiences, they're the times in our life when we're experiencing and learning to surmount challenge in our life. And then sort of after 30, you know, and, and as we go along, you know, we tend not to, yeah. you know, experience new things or or learn um, or even challenge ourselves. We tend to coast Yeah, maybe along. we move it to a kind of autopilot mode. We where do, we, are not we do. Yeah. And I think that's one of the key reasons um, that our brain atrophies. And, and, and what the science shows is that, you know, that lifestyle factors like engaging um, in learning and challenging yourself um, are the things that you need to do. To, to maintain brain volume. So, you know, it, 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 it makes intuitive sense anyway. Yeah, so it's interesting to, you know, see that we lose like 2% of the brain volume every year. No, every and that 10 rate years. Increases, uh, 2%, 2 yeah, every over 10, 10 years, years. sorry. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah I don't think years. we last <laughs> very long. <laughs> sorry, yeah, every decade. Could you talk like what are the, some of the impacts that might have on the ones, uh, uh, you know, on human body as, as a result of the atrophy? The thing is, I suppose a healthy brain, you know, in later life, let's take a disease like dementia um, or Alzheimer's disease that can strike in later life. You have Alzheimer's disease, which is the pathology in your brain. And then you have Alzheimer's dementia, which would be the symptoms of the disease. So failing mental function, confusion, 
problems with language, those kind of things. Now, a person who whose brain has atrophied with age may manifest those symptoms sooner than an individual mm-hmm. who has a healthier brain or greater brain volume. So in essence, it's not actually the amount of pathology that you have in your brain that is important. Um, it is actually the amount of healthy brain that you have mm. in terms of holding on to your cognitive functioning. Now, obviously, um, over time, as a disease will progress in your brain, you'll have less less healthy, healthy brain, brain. And, yeah. and more diseased brain, and you'll reach, reach a crit- critical threshold. But um, the point being that you actually get to hold on to your cognitive functioning for longer. But I mean, living a brain healthy life, having a healthy brain, I mean, none of us know when um, we might be in a car accident or when we might sustain a brain injury through a fall or while playing sport. True. And the same principle applies. The healthier your brain, the better your prognosis um, should you sustain an injury. So um, that really, that that's where that kind of comes in. But um, there's lots of lifestyle factors that contribute to how well your brain will function at any point in time. So for example, sleep is critical for brain health. And mm-hmm. just missing one, one night's sleep will impact on your ability to learn new things the next day. And if you don't get sufficient sleep in an evening, you know, following taking in new information, you may not consolidate those new memories. So it can impact on your ability to create new memories just in our everyday functioning. Brain health is actually about ensuring that your brain can function optimally. Um, and not impact on um, on your life and allow you to actually, you know, maximize your abilities and your potential. I'll come to the sleep and I want to talk a bit more about that because there is some another you know, interesting thing uh, I have read that, you know, you have mentioned somewhere else. But before I talk about that, as you mentioned, like it's not the the volume of the brain that you have, but it's also about the volume of healthy brain. So is there a way that, uh, you know, we can find out how much of healthy brain or do you recommend any scanning or anything which we can do on a regular basis to make sure that uh, the brain cell that we have are the healthy brain cells? Well, yeah, no, I mean, I, I, maybe what I've said is confusing in a sense, but I was using, you know, Alzheimer's, someone with Alzheimer's pathology as an example. Um, so disease is the cause of most serious decline. So something like Alzheimer's disease or a tumor or something like multiple sclerosis, which affects the, um, the myelin sheets that help propagate the electrical signals um, in the brain are damaged. So, no, I wouldn't recommend regular scanning. But if, you know, if people do notice serious changes in in cognitive functioning you know it's always best to go and see see your doctor in case there is something um amiss but uh, for the most part people's brains are healthy they but they could just make them you know more healthy mm-hmm. and increase the number of connections that they have in them and and you know um uh, optimize the size and the volume of their of their brain you know, you you mentioned like sleep is one of those things that helps a lot in making our brain healthy. You have said like creating a sleep environment to, uh, you know, for, for the better sleep. So what do you recommend uh, should our bedroom should be? Or maybe, you know, how do you create the environment where you get uh, not only the length of the sleep, but also the quality sleep? Yeah, I mean, that is really important. People often ask me, you know, how long should I sleep for? But it isn't just the amount of sleep. Um, It's the quality of sleep and also when you get your sleep. It's important in the early part of the night, um, we have more non-REM sleep. And then in the later part of the night, before we wake up in the morning, uh, those few hours before then, we have proportionately more REM sleep, the sleep that occurs when you dream. Um, Mm -hmm. So it's important to get both ends you know that you get you know enough of of both ends because that you don't cut your sleep short at either end because in the early part of the night that's when your memories are consolidated and embedded in your brain and in the later part of the night that's when those new memories are integrated with your 
previous memories and your previous life experiences, which is why sometimes, I don't know if you experience this, but I often do, where you wake up in the morning um, after a good night's sleep with the solution to a problem mm-hmm. or an idea, you know, um, it's the best time for me, actually, for writing. Um, oh, yes. The, the neuroscience supports the old adage, you know, to sleep on a problem um, because it's the new information you've taken in gets the opportunity to be integrated with past experiences and and from that can come insight and and solutions. So it's important. I mean, for for, for adults, sort of over twenty five up up till maybe sixty five, you know, between um, seven to nine hours is is a good amount of time. But it's important to kind of work backwards, perhaps from when you have to get up in the morning, yep. to to then select your um, the time that you need to go to bed. But it's really important. Um, your brain thrives on regularity, and so. It really is important for your brain um, that you go to bed and get up at the same time each day. And that includes weekends, really. Um, and that, that, that means your brain gets to know, you know, when it's going to have its sleep and, and uh, it can work to its best potential. I think it's also important, for, first of all, I mean, you know, this thing about lack of sleep, I mean, this is entirely within our control. But the World Health um, organization has actually identified a sleep loss epidemic that I, I think only about two thirds of us are actually getting sufficient sleep every night. And um, so we, we, we don't seem to value sleep as much as we should. And it obviously serves a really, really important function because it has survived, you know, it has evolved that we that we need sleep. If you think about it, when we sleep, we're at our most vulnerable. So, you know, we obviously really need sleep to carry out um, certain functions. I think just need to really value sleep and unwinding and creating a calming bedtime ritual can be one way to do that. I think we're all working a lot longer than we used to and and we don't have the same boundaries between work and rest as we used to. Uh, You know, we're always on, so to speak, and and work has become a thing rather than a place. So Mm -hmm. work is always with us through our mobile phones or our laptops. Often we're working right up until we go to bed or we're we're unwinding. We think we're unwinding by watching shows on television or Netflix, you know, binge watching a whole TV <laughs> series. Um, but actually, you know, research suggests that watching television is not a way to chill and relax. It actually can increase anxiety and depression. Um, and that makes sense if you think about it, because, you know, for a film to be good, there has to be, you know, um, you know, someone's either going to get killed or someone's going to get ditched or jilted <laughs> or, you know, so it's kind of stressful stuff Increasing, we watch. Yeah, anxiety. You know? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So sleep is definitely one of the, you know, key things that we have said to keep our brain yeah, healthy. What yeah. are the, what are then the other ways, uh, you know, which we can look uh, to, to uh, keep our brain more healthy? Yeah. Well, one really important um, thing is to manage stress. Now, there's nothing inherently wrong with stress. And, and you know, oh, by the way, on the recent uh, post that you have said, uh, you have said like stress is good for the brain. Maybe you can uh, talk a little bit about that as well. Yes. So, yeah, managing stress is, is really important. I mean, again, stress has, has evolved for a reason and it serves a purpose and a very important purpose. It's the thing, actually, I, I mentioned earlier that that challenge and novelty and learning are vital for brain health. And stress, that stress response, the release of cortisol and adrenaline, they're the things that actually can allow you rise to those challenges. So it's really very important. And and I mean, you know, you get a spurt of cortisol every morning, you get a spike of it just before you wake up. And that's what can get you out of bed in the morning to to face the day. Where it impacts on brain function um, is if it becomes chronic and it's poorly managed. Now, the interesting thing is, the stress response evolved, um, you know, it's the fight or, or flight response, really. And it serves a really, really, it can save, save our lives um, when we're in acute or immediate danger. And what's really interesting is when cortisol is released during the stress response, um, cortisol, you know, is, is, is going around your body all the time. But it, it, when it's specifically released during the stress response, it actually goes to a part of your brain called the hippocampus which is a really, really small part of the the brain. It's shaped like a seahorse and it's very deep within your brain and it plays a huge role in learning and memory. And the interesting thing is during the acute stress response, say you've been um, attacked or mugged down a dark alleyway, that cortisol will enhance your memory for that event. 
So mm. it will really um, make you remember that that event. Um, and that's important because it's important that you remember not to go down that alleyway again or that you remember how you escaped from that dangerous situation before. So that makes sense. That's very uh, interesting. In a normal situation, after that acute response, there's this feedback loop within your brain that can send a message to your brain that says, enough already, you know, the danger has passed, switch off the cortisol, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, we think when stress becomes chronic, um, that feedback loop goes a bit haywire and the message doesn't get sent back to switch off the cortisol release. So it continues to be released. And here's where the interesting thing happens. When cortisol then is, is released um, in a chronic fashion, it prevents neurogenesis, which is the growth of new neurons in the hippocampus. And it also prevents neuroplasticity in the hippocampus. So you can actually start to see an atrophy in the hippocampus. It, it's shrinking because it can't grow new neurons and it can't develop new connections. In a sense, chronic stress can impair your ability to learn. And so learning and memory are inextricably linked. So it will also impair your memory. So it's really interesting, um, you know, how that flip occurs. So it's vital that you manage stress well. And I know that people talk a lot about too much stress, but too little stress is really not good for your brain either. Mm -hmm. Because if you think about it, when you don't have enough stress in your life, you're understimulated. And if your brain is understimulated, it's not being challenged, it's not being used. And again, you can, you know, have atrophy, but you can also have boredom and depression, um, which aren't good for your brain either. So it's really a little bit about like Goldilocks. It's about finding your own stress sweet spot, that amount of stress that's just right for you. And it is very different for everybody. So obviously, uh, I'm sure like there is no, is there a way that, I mean, how much stress should I take for my brain's health? Is there a way that I can? No, I mean, it, it really is. It really is about, about managing the stress. And you yes, know, it is. And, yeah. and I should say, in fairness, you know, I mean, there's a lot of objective stressors. I call stressors the things that um, create stress, creates the stress. Unfortunately, stress is used to describe the, the response in your body, you know, your mm-hmm. perception of it and the thing that stresses you. So um, I would talk about the stressor, you know, the, the objective thing that stresses you. Um, some of those, you know, there's nothing we can do about and they are inherently stressful, you know, like a death of a loved one or, you know, money worries or ill health you know, a way to manage those is in a way to acknowledge that you can't control them. But what you can do is control your response to them. So how you react to them, you know, whether you make the decision, can I do anything about this thing? Well, if I can't, well, then there is no point in worrying about it or stressing about it. I may just need to accept it as a situation. Then the other interesting thing is that it doesn't matter whether there's actually a real stressor at all, because if you just imagine that there is a stressor, this mm-hmm. if you just have a psychological um, perception of stress, then that will release your stress response, your physiological stress <laughs> response anyway. So um, that, in a sense, you can look at that as also a way of, of actually getting control about actually viewing and looking at your own way that you perceive stress and working on how you perceive um, issues and and managing how you respond in that way. And actually, in my book, there is a lot of self-assessment so that you can go through and and identify, you know, how you perceive stress and and what might be uh, the stressors in your life. I mean, you'll know when you're not stressed, really, you know, I mean, you will find that you have clarity of thought and, you know, more joy in your life. I I, I think a lot of us can self-identify when we're stressed. But I do have a, you know, a checklist in the book that that of common signs of stress. Um, You know, a loss of a sense of humor actually is a common sign of stress. You know, you just can't see the funny side to anything Mm -hmm. because you're just so focused and locked into this yeah uh, world of stress that sounds really interesting so obviously one of those things to 
uh, manage the stress is breathing and meditation. So how important breathing and uh, meditation then is for the brain health? Yeah, I mean, there's interesting, there's interesting research around, around meditation and, and mindfulness that, that show benefits for brain function. I'm, not everybody has the capacity to meditate in the traditional way that people um, might meditate. So I often say to people when I'm talking to them, but we all can be present minded. And a lot of us, again, as you said earlier, you know, we live on autopilot. Um, and that is a huge part of the problem. You know, we're, we are absent minded. We are not present in the moment. Um, we're either thinking about the future or we are thinking about the past. And if we spent more time actually in the moment, focusing on what we're doing while we're doing it, we can actually keep anxiety and depression at bay. Um, we can also get more joy out of life itself because we start to really experience the moment as we're living it. Yeah, that definitely makes a lot of sense. So are there any kind of physical exercise that do you recommend for the brain health and how frequently should we do those kind of specific activities that you know, you'd like to share? Yeah, so physical exercise. A lot of people, when they ask me about brain health, they're expecting me to say things like, you know, doing Sudoku or crosswords or all those kind of <laughs> mentally challenging things or, you know, study physics or that kind of thing. But actually, one of the most important things that you can do um, is to get physically active. Because as I mentioned earlier, your, your brain um, consumes a lot of uh, nutrients and, and oxygen, and um, it needs a healthy cardiovascular system to do that. And physical exercise will help to keep um, your system fit and well so that your brain can be provided you know, with the oxygen that it needs and, and serviced well. So aerobic exercise is very good for your brain. I mean, the guidelines would be the same sort of guidelines, you know, that people say just for physical fitness, which is, I think, about 150 minutes a, across a week, you know, divided up as five days a week. But I wouldn't see that as an excuse to not exercise on the other two days. Um, I also think it's quite a small portion of our day to engage in physical activity. So I would suggest that people, you know, incorporate physical activity as part of their day, as well as setting aside time. And, and like eating, I would say that physical exercise is not an option. It, it needs to become an integra integral part of our day. But also, in addition to becoming more active, we actually need to sit less. We spend an awful lot of our time sitting an awful lot of our time you know sitting in front of computers or or in 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 jobs you know um where we where we actually could sit maybe sometimes for five and six hours at a time and and that's yep. just really really not good for you so i mean myself i try to break up long spells of sitting by um setting an alarm on my phone I tried every 30 minutes, but um, and I think that's what I was doing when I was writing the book, but um, I do it now for about every hour or so. And even if I just get up and walk around, and um, sometimes actually that's how I, I incorporate my exercise in the day, you know, because I might get up and actually say, well, I'm going to do some sit-ups now. Um, but yes, breaking, that's that's just as, as important is, is to avoid long stints uh, sitting. How long that break looks like for you after every hour? Of sitting. Yeah, just a couple of minutes, do you know, mm -hmm. it just has to be a couple of minutes. But I think there's some statistic um, that I have, which is if you stood for two hours more every day, it's the equivalent of, of running multiple ma um, marathons in a year. Um, you know, it also actually will make a, a huge difference um, in terms of weight loss as well, if anybody is, is, is trying to, to lose weight, because you, I think you burn one calorie um, sitting for every two calorie, you know, you'll burn two calories standing, uh, etc. So it's a passive activity. And it also puts strain on your, on your spinal cord. And, you know, it's just better to, to break the old sitting up. Yeah, that's interesting. So, you know, one of the fears that people do have is, you know, losing their memory. And your book is also about maximizing your memory, right? So yes. what are the ways that people can maximize their memory? Yeah, well, to be perfectly honest, if you live a brain healthy life, you can maximize your memory in a sense. So a lot of people are often looking for little tips 
um, on how you can, um, you know, improve your memory. And they don't look to the lifestyle things that make a difference to your memory. And that's the thing. Sleep is one of the best things you can do for your memory. Managing stress can, um, is really important, too. But also your your attitude and your outlook matters. So we know that if, if you know, from research that um, if you remind an older adult, for example, that memory function declines with age, Mm -hmm. um, they will perform more p poorly on a memory test. So having a positive attitude about your memory function and about um, how you age um, well and a positive attitude to aging will also help um, your memory function. Um, but there's things and, and, and tips that you can take on board as well. People often find things like remembering names very difficult. That's not surprising because when you think about it, names are very abstract. You know, there isn't there isn't anything concrete. visual kind of yeah. Yes, there isn't really anything concrete to hold on to. And just trying to remember a name all by itself is very difficult. So so some of the tips I would suggest around that is it's it's really about adding meaning. So the, the trick to memory is 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 meaning. Um so if you, for example, meet someone uh, for the first time and you're, you're, you want to commit their name to memory, think about their name. Really look at them. Pay attention. Mm -hmm. You know, take note of specific things about them. See if you can link that to their name. Um, you know, like Betty with the bob haircut or, or <laughs> you know, yeah. well, you know, or Andrew the accountant or... Um, whatever, try and enrich the memory as soon as you try to create it. Another interesting thing about memory function is if, if you look, preschool children, um, when they're exploring the world, when they're learning and taking in information, they explore the world with all of their senses. They put things in their mouths, they touch things, they smell things. They feel things. They roll around on things. You they know, be present. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, they, they are really totally are. 100% they're really, present. But they're also engaging all of their senses. And then when they go to school, certainly um, in the schools we have here, you know, you're you're told to to sit down and and in a desk for hours at a time. And you know, we used to be told actually to cross our arms so that we didn't use our hands to touch things and distract ourselves. And the focus becomes on learning using only language. Hmm. And we stop using our senses. And I only have to remind you, you know, if I say to you, some of the most important memories are the memories that have stuck with you across your life, um, may be brought back to you by a smell or a scent, a scent of perfume or a certain type of food cooking. And suddenly you can be transported back 20 years to an event in your life or even the touch of a, a you know, a, a type of silk or, you know, those things can really um, embed a memory um, much more strongly than just a, using words. So if you want to really improve your memory and maximize your memory, I would suggest that you start engaging um, as many of your senses as you can. And that's about being present in the moment, in a sense, and, and actively engaging with the world and, and making a conscious effort to take note of what's happening in the current situation and, and enhance the memory. Another really important thing is, and again, it goes back to this thing of absent-mindedness, attention is really the first step in the memory-making process. So a lot of people become concerned as they get older and they say, oh, my memory is terrible. I keep forgetting where I leave my keys or um, I keep forgetting where I put my glasses and those kind of things. But if you actually ask them and you talk through it, you know, when they come home from work in the evening, they're probably either thinking about their day at work or the traffic mm. they've just been in on the way home or they're yeah. coming in and they're thinking about kicking off their high heels and changing into something <laughs> else or what's in the fridge what am i going to have for yeah. dinner and then they're yeah, not we just throw the away moment. the key somewhere else they yeah. just throw the key down and it's very very simple they haven't attended to where they put the information and if you haven't attended 
to a piece of information. You can't encode it at a me- as a memory. You can't consolidate it when you sleep at night. And therefore, then the next day, you can't retrieve a memory that you haven't created. So paying attention is a really, really good way to maximize your memory. I think both of these uh, you know, ways that you have shared, engaging all of your sense and paying attention are a very, very important because you know, on the world, and even when we are having conversation with some person, then we are, you know, very distracted with a lot of, uh, sometimes with technology, and we are just trying to, you know, trying and act like that we are there on the conversation, or, you know, at that particular place, but we actually are not there. And as a result of that, uh, you know, that doesn't get imprinted on our memory. So I think that's a really... Yes, you know, and we have so many distractions these days. And we think we're multitasking, but essentially what we're actually doing is task switching. So we're briefly paying attention to what the person's saying, and then we're switching to our laptop or our phone, and then we're, you know, so we actually really do need to be more present in the moment. Now, I'm all for technology. I mean, I love technology, and technology can be, you know, a a really good aid to memory. But if you use it appropriately, I, I couldn't survive without my Google Calendar. You know, my life mm-hmm. is on my computer. Um, I know where I have to be by, you know, opening up my calendar and looking what I have on for the next day or the next week. And that's wonderful. I don't have to keep that in my memory. I know that all I have to remember is where I have to access it. Similarly with phone numbers, you know, when I was younger, um, you had to hold everybody's phone number in your head. <laughs> you know, you knew a lot yeah. of people's phone numbers off by heart. I used to know my bank account number off by heart. Um, and we don't have to do that anymore. Um, and that's OK, um, because using that technology then will should free up resources in your brain, provided you use those freed up resources to do something else you know, something else that will challenge your brain or bring joy in your life. I think it becomes problematic when you depend on those external resources and technologies uh, and then become lazy. Um, That's where it becomes um, a a problem. So I like to use them to support and and free up my brain so I can do things that excite me. Yeah, more productive and then something that challenges your brain even further. Yeah, something like going to the university at 42. And uh, so please talk about that. Like, how did this happen that you went uh, to university at 42 and you developed this interest in psychology? Uh, how, how did that happen? <laughs> oh, I don't know, really. I don't know. <laughs> I, um, how did it happen? It's funny, really, I suppose. I've had a few careers, if I think about it, but um, I was an actor. I was actually a, a soap actor on our uh, flagship soap opera here in Ireland on on national television Ooh. and um yes and and that uh, sounds so fun yeah yes it was and actually that's something that was really really good for <laughs> for my memory function because we we had five episodes a week so that's a lot of learning and memorizing but it served me well actually when I went to university then <laughs> for my sure. exams <laughs> um uh practice does help with memory but yes I had very very um prominent part it was going to be a while before in a sense I could work again Ireland is a small enough acting community and I thought that I would like to do um you know a night course maybe and I inquired about a night course and one of those sort of serendipitous moments um I happened to ring about half an hour before the closing of applications for mature students for a full life, full-time course in psychology. Wow. And yes, I got a place. Um, so I, I can't say that this was, you know, fully planned that I was going to do this. But a lot of people said to me, you know, this is a big jump going from acting to psychology. And for me, it was no jump at all because the reason um, I, that I was drawn to acting was because I've always been fascinated with human behavior and acting is a way to explore human behavior from the inside out and that's actually why I loved working in television and soap as opposed to theater because theater it's more about performance and you know you repeat performance you could be in a show for six nights a week for a year and and that didn't excite me what excited me was trying to find a way in and understand why a character would behave in a particular way and make that real and believable and um, psychology really um, is the same. It's trying to understand 
why we do what we do, you know, how our, how our brain impacts on our behavior and the bits that are, ha- have evolved and why they've evolved and, and the bits that are a consequence of the society that we're brought in, up in and the culture that we've been brought up, up in and the, bi- the bits that we can change to improve ourselves. And yes, I thought that I would combine the degree with the acting, but found that I absolutely loved doing the degree. And then I got a scholarship to do a PhD. And while doing that scholarship, really, then was what really brought me then into the area of brain health and science communication. And it's kind of where I found my purpose in life, my icky guy I don't know if you've heard about that that <laughs> light kind of bulb a, moment maybe yeah 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 well it's, it's icky guy is you know a Japanese concept about your yeah uh, you know your reason for living the your purpose True. in life for, for getting up out uh, your reason for getting up out of bed really but yeah I mean it was really exciting to be in the Institute of Neuroscience it's a multidisciplinary institute and there was a lot of really exciting research being done and obviously reading research for my PhD I found some amazing information that I felt could be really empowering for people about their brain health and about reducing their risk for developing diseases like dementia. And it just struck me that scientists were were talking to each other about this science at niche conferences and in academic journals that are, for the most part, inaccessible to the general public. And I just feel, felt sort of an ethic and almost moral responsibility to take this information and tell it to whoever would listen. Yes. And I mean, initially, I I, I sort of told everybody, you know, um, who would listen the information. And and then I found ways um, and funding to to get that information out to as wide an audience as I possibly could. That that kind of was a moment that changed things, really. And that that was uh, that also allowed me sort of combine my two my two loves really, you know, which is, you know, the neuroscience and psychology and communication and, and film. Um, and I started making animations that explain these complex neuroscientific concepts in a way that's not only easy to understand, but fun and entertaining. Cause oh yeah, they do. They definitely have you fun looked at some of the us, an- yeah. animations, yes? Yeah, I have discovered you through one of your animations that you put out. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah, too. yeah. So, so um, yes, um, and I was very fortunate, you know, that 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 I went to some people with um, uh, with an idea because there was a particular problem around dementia, and I don't know how it is, you know, where you are, but there's a lot of stigma around dementia, and we need people to talk more about it and be more open about it and realize that it's not a normal part of aging, and that there are risk factors and things that you can do to, to prevent it and and prolong your functioning even if you do have it. But I found that, you know, even though I worked with organizations like the Alzheimer Society here in Ireland, if they sent me a video, you know, mid-afternoon and said, Sabina, we, you know, we know you're passionate about this. We'd love to know what you think about our video. I wouldn't want to click the link because I just found all the videos were quite depressing. <laughs> and I didn't want to be depressed in the afternoon at work. And I just thought, okay, we have a real problem here. If even I, who care so much about this, won't click this link, how are we going to get anyone else to click these links? And mm-hmm. so I went to some funders with an idea to say that I wanted to make 10 fun films about dementia. <laughs> and um, uh, yeah, they gave me the funding and I worked with fabulous um, animators and together and following, you know, about six months of sleepless nights, terrified that it would be a disaster. We produced mm-hmm. 10 animations that just took on a life of their own. Um, we just put them out there. We had no money to advertise them. Uh, we just put them up online. And we did a very small press release from the university. And our own national news program came across them and just thought they were so novel and new that they featured on the news. And we were covered in all our newspapers and radio shows. And, and before I knew it, they were being viewed in over 140 countries worldwide. And since then, um, a lot of volunteers, you know, I don't have any money, you know, to keep these going that we just do. And um, um, volunteers from all over the globe have have uh, volunteered to create subtitles for them in multiple languages. 
Um, so we have like Korean and French and Spanish subtitles, etc. And then a couple of years ago, and I'd love to say that very delightedly, that the um, NHS actually in the UK, they um, paid to have the animations revoiced in um, a number of languages, including Hindi and Punjabi. So if you go onto my YouTube channel, you will find these animations, these 10 animations in Hindi and Punjabi. And it would be fabulous if people just shared them because it's just a wonderful way. They're free online. And if anybody wants to embed them on their website, they can contact me. And, you know, I, I give people free licenses to do that because the point is just let's get the message out there to as many people as possible. It's interesting, you know, the way you have transitioned you on career and, you know, the way you have put together, put that together and blended both of these career. And then now on, you know, the new thing that you have chosen at uh, 42 years and you are doing a lot of things into that. And it's it's inspiring. Your own journey is very inspiring in that sense. And the kind of work that you are doing in, in terms of raising either it's in terms of raising the awareness about the dementia or about the brain health. And your book is already doing amazing work. So that's that's pretty awesome. Are there things that you would like people not to do or things that people shouldn't be doing, you know, that that impacts their brain? Yes. Yes, there are. Uh, one of the first things that jumps to mind is smoking. I'm an ex-smoker. I understand that it can be challenging to give it up. But smokers have thinner cortices. That's the outer layer of your brain. <laughs> mm. Smoking is really bad for your brain um, for a number of reasons. Uh, there's the toxins um, and your, your brain cells are, are very vulnerable to, to toxins. But also it will impact on your cardiovascular health. So your heart health and the health of your um, vascular system, which your brain is totally dependent on. If they're not working properly, then your brain can't work properly because it will be deprived of the oxygen um, that it needs to function well. So that's an absolute. If you smoke, you just got to quit. That's it. And don't say I'm giving up. Just say I don't smoke. And within about three weeks, if you just don't talk about it, just say I don't smoke. It's disgusting. It's horrible. Um, your, your brain will become um, obedient, but it really is worth uh, working on that. Um, alcohol consumption is not great for brain the brain either. <laughs> <laughs> um, we used to say a moderate amount of alcohol was okay, but the, the suggestion is that even moderate amounts of alcohol can impair your cognitive functioning. But, you know, it's about finding balance in your life as well. And I mean, people often say to me, do you you know, do you follow rigidly all the advice in your book? And I say, well, I'm human. I do my very best to follow them as best yeah. I can. But, um, you know, sometimes I fall off the wagon and, and I, I see it as a work in progress. I try to work on, you know, aspects, uh, you know, at certain points um, in time. But really, if you look at risk factors for things like dementia, type 2 diabetes, midlife high blood pressure, obesity, low levels of physical activity, they are all risk factors for dementia. And so if you're doing things that aren't good for your heart, they're not going to be good for your brain either. So it is important to maintain a healthy weight and a healthy diet. Amazing. So is there anything else that we haven't discussed about the brain that you'd like to share with my listeners? Um, I think we've done a really good job of talking about the brain, haven't we? We've said sleep, we've said stress, we've said looking after your heart. Um, we've said getting physically active and then attitude really is hugely important. A positive outlook helps tremendously. Uh, optimism and smiling. How did I forget this? Smiling is my favorite, favorite tip for brain health. <laughs> how, how does that help? The oh, brain? It, well, it, it boosts your immune, uh, immune function. It lowers your blood pressure. It's generally good for your health. It releases endorphins in your brain that make you feel good. Um, and it helps promote the growth of new brain cells. So it's, and it's free, <laughs> Actually, <laughs> as are most things. And, and, and you know, a funny thing about there's so many benefits to smiling and to laughter. You know, laughter is nature's best stress buster. You know, if people want to, to manage stress, um, you know, laughing is one of the best things. But smiling, it used to really puzzle me that our brain is the most complex known structure in the universe. And we know also from research that all of those positive things that I've just mentioned that happen when we smile 
They also happen if you fake a smile. If you literally just move your muscles into the shape of a, a smile, so if you synthesize a smile, you get all of those health benefits. And that really puzzled me. I said, how can the brain that's so smart be fooled by something so simple? <laughs> and then actually I twigged, probably after a really good night's sleep one morning, I woke up and I just said, I realized it's because our brain is so clever that it can be fooled by that. It actually has given us our own mechanism to boost our mood, to boost our immune function, to lower our blood pressure. You know, it's amazing and it's very simple. So I often I say I prescribe smiling five times a day. Once first time, first thing in the morning, because it's a wonderful way to start the day. Once last thing at night, because it's a great way to refocus yourself and, and, and focus on the positive. I suggest smiling, sharing a smile, at least one smile with another person. Actually, that's one thing we didn't cover, which is social engagement, because smiling with another person um, encourages you to engage with somebody. And then I say, you know, you can use the other two smiles however you want. <laughs> social engagement, being with other people is really, really um, important for brain health. Being socially engaged with people is quite a challenging activity for your brain. Being on your own, you know, your, your brain is not being stimulated and, and used as it should be. It also impacts on your fear response and um, on your ability to sleep soundly. Yeah, staying socially engaged and connected with people is really important. It's a big problem here for us in Ireland because of the way we have our society structured. We're very age um, segregated. And uh, a lot of people socialize with people the same age as them. And so as people get older, their social circles diminish and they often become isolated um, and lonely. And that can impact on their cognitive function at the very point in their time where they need to be um, challenging um, their brain function and being engaged. So it's very important. Wow. I think uh, that's a, that's really a powerful one because... Uh, engaging with people when you are uh, with people and also smiling, uh, that helps a lot in terms of just not not only for the brain. I think that's uh, important for your overall uh, health as well. Everything, uh, in, yeah. In terms of, yeah, everything, right? In terms of uh, mitigating the stress that you might have and feel good about yourself. Uh, and, and I think that's really important. But isn't it so easy to, to forget to do it? Oh, yeah, it's, because it's free. Yeah, no, that's that's one thing. And I, I but I think also as well, I mean, I don't know how it is with you over there, but I mean, a lot of us work in isolation now because of technology. We can work from anywhere and a lot of people work yeah. from home and there is no actual human contact. We might True. be in contact via a keyboard, via email and talking to people, but we're having less and less human contact. And as a consequence, a lot of us see smiling as a reaction. You smile back at someone if they smile as, at you. So when you're on your own, you actually really do have to make that conscious effort. So I know it sounds fun that I say I prescribe smiling at least five times a day, but I do mean it because I myself, because I work in isolation a lot, um, I have to remind myself to smile because I'm not necessarily engaging with other people. And actually, I have pet dogs, and they're wonderful because they always give me some reason to, to smile. So, yes, it's super important, particularly in, in this technological age that we live in. Amazing. So it has been an amazing conversation uh, with you, Shavina. Guys, make sure that you check her book out, 100 Days to a Younger Brain, Maximize Your Memory, Boost Your Brain Health and Defy Dementia, a very helpful book which has already been a bestseller and getting a lot of amazing feedback from the readers. And also make sure that you check out the videos that Savina has been referring on her YouTube channel. I have watched some of those animations, super simple to understand. And I think very important for you to understand about your brain health. And now that, you know, we have had this long discussion on the brain health, how, what to do and what not to do, how to keep our brain healthy. I hope that you got a lot of ideas on that. So is there a book or two that has influenced you personally in the recent past other than yours? Yes, yes, actually there is. And I mentioned it earlier and, and it's, um, uh, there's a few books about these. I should actually have got up the name, but, um, Ikigai is a, is a book that I, that I read very recently this year. Um, it spoke to me a lot because it, 
it actually, it, you know, it's a, as I said, it's an old Japanese concept about finding your purpose in life. But it was so funny when I read it, there was so many things in that that parallel with things in my book, you know, about brain health. Um, but coming from this, um, you know, uh, the, the, the people that... Ancient that, philosophy, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you know, and, and it, it, you know, it's, it's wisdom. Um, it's the Japanese secret for a long and happy life. And really, there's a, an island off J Japan called Okinawa that has, uh, you know, the longest living people um, in the world. They have a huge proportion of centenarians um, and they don't retire. They don't have the concept of retirement. They always have a purpose in life and they stay active and learning and challenging themselves right to the end. And I think that's really important. I'm, I'm, I'm not pro-retirement. Pro I understand if people are doing a job that they dislike, you know, that they may want to stop it. But, but that doesn't mean that you stop learning new things or challenging yourself for. I, I think I, I don't know how it is with you, but but certainly here in Ireland and in a lot of countries, you know, here, I think it's the same in the United States and the United Kingdom. We have very ageist societies and older people are um, pushed to the margins of society and not treated as well or as equally as they should be. They may get respect, but they don't necessarily have equality or value. They're not valued as they should be. And as we get older, we gain wisdom and we are far better at conflict resolution and our brain functions much better in certain ways than those of a younger person. Uh, that's something that that I loved from this book is, is you know, that everybody has value and, and everybody contributes to the community. Um, they find their purpose, the thing that they're good at, um, that has a nice blend between the thing that their community or or the world needs and uh, their passion, and and it's a blending of those. So that that the the author is actually of that are actually um, Hector Garcia and Francesca Morales, and it's a very you know it's a small book, and it's one of those that you can dip in and out of. But um, that would be a recent one that that jumped out at me. Uh, Sabina, I have got one more question left for you. But before that, if people would like to reach out to you, maybe learn more about the kind of work that you are doing and maybe get some more tips on the brain health, how they can actually reach out to you, what's the best possible way? Well, actually, if they visit my website, which is sabinabrennan.ie, they can connect with me um, via that website. And that website has all the various information as well, but there's also a contact form. They can follow me on Twitter at Sabina underscore Brennan. I'm a real Twitterer. I love Twitter. There's my YouTube channel. They, they can view on that. But actual, you know, interaction, I'm great on Twitter and, and through my website would be fabulous. So here's the last question for you. <laughs> I'm scared. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Sabina, I imagine that you have done all the work that you wanted to do in your life, raised awareness about the brain health and did everything. And then now that you are standing on a stadium, and let's say this one is the largest stadium that has ever been built in the history of the world, and there are millions of people who are there standing and uh, you know listening to you eagerly and passionately, and you have got only one uh, minute to say the most important lesson that you'd like to share with the people, what would be your message? Oh my goodness. I think that great things can happen when lots of people do little things. Together, we can change the world. We can really make a difference. Amazing. Together, we can make a difference. This has been phenomenal. Thank you so much for being on the show, Sabina. I really enjoyed having this conversation with you. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me on. Hey guys, thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Inspiring Talk podcast. I hope you got some inspiration or learned something from this episode. If you did, make sure to share this message with your friends by visiting theinspiringtalk.com forward slash 6262. That is theinspiringtalk.com forward slash 62. Do connect with me on Facebook, Instagram or Twitter at the red BJ Speaks and let me know what you think about this show. Thank you for listening. I'll catch you in the next. Now, go out there and do something inspiring.